Welcome to you all. Welcome to our 11.30. So glad that you're here. I'm Jim. I'm one of the pastors. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, listening online, just want to say a massive welcome to you as well. So glad you're able to um, catch up with the messages here. Um, Ten days to go, everyone. Ten days to Christmas. Am I able to say happy Christmas yet? Is that allowed? Or Happy Christmas. Yeah, we'll do it anyway. Like Tim said, it's just been an extraordinary week, really. Obviously, it has been politically, general election and all that, but I'm not going to talk about that this morning. Um, But just loads of Christmas things happening here. And um, I do just want to honour some people. Um, The Carol Concerts for the Schools, amazing volunteers came in to run all the tech side of that. Um, OJ and Josh and Tim Perrett and guys just serving brilliantly. And then... Angie B and her extraordinary Christmas cracker team just do a phenomenal job every year. And all the guys, wait, not yet. I'm going to give you the cue. All the guys that are working towards next week, honestly, you have just no idea how much hard work is going into next Sunday. It's going to be a fantastic Sunday. And in so many ways, technical, hospitality, um, gifts, creativity, music, quiet. I mean, just so much work. So as I'm pastor here, I am so grateful for these amazing men and women who are giving themselves so fully. And I think they're representing us so well as a church. Can we now thank them and give them a big round of applause? Fantastic stuff. And listen, I know no one wants to think about 2020 yet, okay? Because it's a weird thing about Christmas, isn't it? Even though 2020 is like two and a half weeks away, it could be like four years away. We just don't think about anything post-Christmas. But can I just say one thing about 2020? Is that as we come back into the new year here in January, um, we've just felt really um, provoked as a team to really have a focus on prayer in January. So throughout January, we're going to be doing a teaching series called How to Pray. We're going to have many moments where we are gathering as a church to pray in January. There'll be a prayer room at the end of the month. And we're looking to find ways to encourage and equip us in our personal prayer lives and also our corporate prayer lives. So as we come back in, just look for social media stuff at the beginning of the year because we're really looking forward to spending some time just wanting to grow our prayer lives together individually. So that's coming up in 2020. But anyway, back to 2019. Um, We're going to be looking at the Christmas story again this morning from Luke's Gospel. If you have a Bible, you may want to turn there or a device. Going to be focusing in on Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking again at the life of Mary. Um, Last week, Harry did a brilliant job looking at um, part of Mary's story. If you were here, you would have heard his message. Talked about when Angel Gabriel arrived, announced this incredible news to Mary that she would carry a child and that this child would be um, a son called Jesus who would be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And her reaction and her response, and Harry really helpfully just helped us to think through our own response when God speaks about how we get caught up into his purposes and plans. It was a really great message. It's on YouTube, so you can watch it if you want to have a look. Although there's one thing, there was one moment, just if you were here, you'll know this. When Harry said, kind of quiet, I thought, Critically, he said, I had an opportunity perhaps to do an internship with someone like Mike Pinovacci, but instead I chose to stay here and have to work with Tim. And he kind of, if you were here, he kind of criticized having to stay here instead of going off around the world. So that one moment beside, it was an excellent message. But (laughs) quite ironically, actually, when I was chatting to Harry during the week, um, years and years ago, many years ago, I also had the opportunity to go and work in my pit of Achi, but instead felt God was saying, no, knuckle down and get involved in King's Church. So his story is my story 15 years ago. So here we go. Um, we're going to look at Luke 1, like I said. We're going to be looking at what happened next in Mary's story. Um, we read that Mary travels from where she lived, in Nazareth, to see a relative called Elizabeth. And um, we read what happened when they met. And then we read an incredible song. Um, This message is titled Mary's Song um, that we read about in Luke 1. She sings this amazing song of worship um, in the opening chapters of Luke. And you may know it as uh, Mary's Magnificat. So it's what it's known as from a Latin word that comes from the first line of the song. And I love reading Luke's account of Jesus' life. So there's four different accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke um, was a doctor, and he wrote a really thorough well-researched and investigated account of Jesus' life. And he had a real specific reason what he was doing. If you look right at the beginning of Luke chapter 1, in verse 3, you'll see his reason for writing this account. He says, with this in mind, since 
I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. He's writing to a Roman friend of his called Theophilus, and he's saying, I wanted to write down an account of what happened in Jesus' life. So you may know the certainty of the things that happened. And look what he said. He said, I have carefully investigated everything. We know Luke um, spent time talking with those who walked and lived with Jesus. He talked with eyewitnesses. He researched carefully everything that had happened in Jesus' life and wrote it down. So we know Luke is a very thorough um, account of Jesus' life. And we know that he spent time with eyewitnesses. And it kind of makes me think and, and ask the question, I wonder if Luke spent time with Mary. I wonder if when Mary was later on in her years, whether Luke had an opportunity to sit down and say, so Mary, can I, can I ask you some questions? Commentators are mixed. Some people think he may have spent time with Mary. Some people think they may not have done. But I like to just think through, just imagine what that might have been like. Imagine Mary later on in life. And Luke comes up to her and says, Mary, thank you so much for giving me some time. You see, what I'm doing is I'm wanting to write an account about your son, Jesus. But I really want to know everything. Can you take me back to the start of the story can you take me back right to the beginning, like when you first discovered you were pregnant? Can you tell me what happened? And he opens up pad and pen. I, mean, I know he wouldn't have had a pad and pen, but roll with me. And, and he says, can you tell me everything? And, and Mary sits there and takes a deep breath and says, well, Luke, it was like this. It was one ordinary day in Nazareth, just a day like any other. And then suddenly an angel appeared and got in gave me this message and she goes on into her story. Can you imagine Luke just listening to every word? Just amazing. You know, I've, we've got the privilege of um, having Terry and Wendy Virgo in our church there in the first meeting. There's been moments where I've said to Terry, Terry, tell me about when you became a Christian. Tell me what happened at the beginning of our family of churches that we're part of. And I'm just listening to every word. And can you imagine Luke listening to Mary's every word of what happened when Jesus, the story of Jesus began in her life. Certainly Luke contains some information that other gospel writers don't include, actually. He tells us about Elizabeth and Zechariah in chapter 1. I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about them. It's interesting how certain people aren't talked about in the Christmas nativity stories, even though they're right there in the story. So if you went up to anyone and said, tell me about Christmas, tell me the Christmas story and the nativity, what would they tell you? They will tell you about shepherds, and they'll tell you about wise men and donkeys and innkeepers and Bethlehem and stars and that kind of thing. No one, I doubt, will tell you about Elizabeth and Zechariah. It's really interesting as we look at Luke's account because in between angel Gabriel giving a message to Mary and Mary going with Joseph to Bethlehem, there's this story of Elizabeth. And she never gets talked about at Christmas, but she's right there, right in between the Gabriel story and Bethlehem, there's Elizabeth. And we want to look a little bit at what happens here. So let's read it. I'm going to read verse 39, just to 45 for the moment. So at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. Let's just consider these verses for a moment. Verse 39 says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. At that time. At what time? Well, most people think it was as soon as, pretty much, Gabriel had come to announce the news that she was going to be pregnant with Jesus. Pretty soon after that encounter, Mary rushes to be with her elderly relative, Elizabeth in a village in Judea, pretty much straight away. She'd heard from the angel Gabriel that Elizabeth herself was pregnant. If you look back at verse 36 of the story, Gabriel clearly says to Mary, even Elizabeth, your relative's going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Elizabeth was carrying um, John the Baptist. 
um, who would herald the way for Jesus to come and prepare the way. And Gabriel told Mary, even your elderly relative is also pregnant, six months pregnant. Maybe that's why she felt, I'm going to go and see Elizabeth. But it wasn't a simple thing to just do that. We hear that she went to Syria and think, well, that's nice. She'd nip around the corner for a cup of tea. Between Nazareth and the hill country of Judea is a distance of about 100 miles. There's no trains, no cars, no Uber. She's got to find a way to get there, young, teenager, pregnant, just heard kind of life-transforming, changing, shattering news. And now she's thinking, what am I going to do? And she goes to spend time with Elizabeth, who lives 100 miles away. Been a journey of four or five days to get there. I wonder why she went. Story doesn't tell us, but maybe this is me speculating a little bit. But I wonder if she kind of thought, I need to get out of Nazareth for a little while. This is just huge. I've got to get some space to process what I have just been told. Or maybe actually some people had discovered this news that she was pregnant and the gossip in the village had already begun. Here she is, a married, young, a teenager and pregnant and she's thinking, I want to get out of the gossip. Or maybe she's thinking, who's going to believe my story? Who's going to believe me that an angel came and spoke to me? Well, hang on a second. My, my relative Elizabeth, it seems like something miraculous has happened to her. She's elderly and conceived. If anyone's going to understand my story, maybe Elizabeth will understand my story. Maybe I'll go and spend some time with her. Maybe it's this. Maybe this is the time when Joseph said that he didn't want anything to do with her and was going to plan to divorce her and separate. No, Joseph had that moment where he thought, maybe I shouldn't actually marry this. She's pregnant. He was confused. Maybe there's a gap between her telling Joseph and Joseph getting the dream when the angel says, no, no, stay with Mary. And she's now thinking, I'm rejected. I'm alone. What am I going to do? We don't actually know But imagine many of those things are going on in Mary's life as she travels to be with Elizabeth. Maybe Elizabeth only would believe me. And what's Elizabeth's story? Let's just consider that. And it's important that we see this because this comes before Bethlehem and shepherds and wise men and anything else. Elizabeth was married to a, a guy called Zechariah. He was a priest in the temple. Read all about that in the first part of Luke chapter 1. And Zechariah and Elizabeth um, were old in years, we know that, the Bible clearly tells us, and they were unable to have a family themselves. Luke 1 verse 7 tells us they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. They were both very old. Different generation to Mary altogether. They were elderly, um, he was a priest, um, and we have this incredible story for them that again an angel arrives. Again, an angel says to Zechariah, you're going to have a son. You're to call him John. John the Baptist had prepared the way for Jesus. And we read the story, and Zechariah couldn't believe what the angel was saying and said, I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years, but Elizabeth did fall pregnant. And in Luke 1, 25, we read her kind of declare in celebration and praise, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So these two women have so much actually in common. They both find themselves in unexpected, surprising circumstances. Both have received the favor of God. Um, Elizabeth says that here, the Lord's done this for me. He has shown me his favor. Gabriel announced to Mary, the Lord has shown you his favor. Harry talked last week about favor being the grace and kindness and love of God. I hadn't deserved any of this. There's nothing extraordinary about their lives. God had shown them favor by choosing them to fulfill these roles in his purposes. One's a teenager. One's a much older lady. Both have fallen pregnant unexpectedly, miraculously. Both have had angels in their story. And both, interestingly, would have faced some kind of disgrace among the people. We see that Elizabeth says, he's taken away my disgrace among the people. She would have grown up Um, in the Jewish culture especially, with the rest of the community in the village looking upon her life um, and Zechariah's life, without a family, which in Jewish culture would have been a sign of the favor of God. And she would have felt the gossip. She would have felt people talking of her and about her and her husband. She would have lived with that for years, actually. And Mary felt a different kind of disgrace. Here she was, young, unmarried, pregnant, a community whispering, wondering what had happened to her. There's incredible similarities between their stories. It's incredible. Both of them lived 
color under this sense of disgrace from others and shame from others. But neither of them in the story see themselves as victims, but as blessed. It's an interesting thing. How can we be blessed when actually the whole community it feels with poor disgrace or shame upon us? They're blessed because they knew they were in the favor and the purposes of God for their lives. Whatever anyone else said, they knew they were being obedient to what God was calling them to, and that God has shown kindness to them. Circumstantially, life was pretty difficult for Mary and Elizabeth, yet they found their joy in being obedient to God's plan. Harry talked a bit about this last week. Again, whatever we think our life is or isn't about, when the circumstances come that we had expected or not expected, where do we find our joy? Mary and Elizabeth find their joy in being at the center of God's purpose for their life. They're like, yeah, people may say what they want, and circumstantially this is pretty hard, but I, want, I know God, and I know his purposes, and I want to be right there, and that's where I'm going to find my joy is to be obedient to God. And in our lives, there's an encouragement for us that we should not find our joy from our circumstances, nor our joy from other people's opinions of us, but our joy in being obedient to the will of God in our lives, because that is the best thing for us. Harry encouraged us to find out God's plan for our life and jump on board. Here we have two women who have just done that. So Mary travels this long distance, 100 miles, to be with Elizabeth at Elizabeth's house. And when she arrives, something extraordinary happens. Um, we can read these verses sometimes and just kind of read over them. But let's just ponder what actually is going on here. When Elizabeth, verse 41, heard Mary's greeting, the baby, John the Baptist, in the womb, six months pregnant, leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we read these verses and we can kind of, kind of go over them quickly. But just think about that for a moment. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, John the Baptist leapt in her womb of joy and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just incredible. Gabriel had actually promised such a thing. If you look back in chapter 1 verse 15, when Gabriel came to speak to Zechariah, he was talking about the son that God would give to them. And he actually said that your son, in verse 15, will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. What a remarkable thought that babies in the womb can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that extraordinary? And here's a promise. Your baby will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. And something happens when Mary turns up that prompts John the Baptist, six months in the womb, to leap. And for Mary to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I find this extraordinary. Um, it's likely Mary would not have been visibly pregnant at this time. Jesus would have been a tiny embryo, tiny in the womb. And yet even the presence of Jesus as this tiny embryo in the womb of Mary caused John the Baptist to leap with joy and for Mary to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that incredible? That the presence of Jesus brings joy to people. Even Jesus in embryonic form can bring joy and can cause John the Baptist to leap in the womb of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, in her old age, she shouts out. It's like a shriek in a loud voice. This isn't a murmur. This is a declaration. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth knew something had happened in her young relative, Mary. But here's the thing. Mary would not have been visibly pregnant. And um, there's, no, there's no WhatsApp, text message, email, postal system. There was no way Mary could have in advance told Elizabeth her news, but the moment Mary arrives and brings a greeting, Elizabeth knows something's happened. You're carrying my Lord. What a thing. This baby that can't even be visible, Elizabeth recognizes this is the child we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. This is my Lord. This is the one I will worship in your womb. It's such a beautiful encounter, this, and so often we read over it and miss some of the detail of it. Here is Elizabeth declaring worship of Jesus, even though Jesus can't even be visibly seen in Mary's pregnant body yet. And she declares, 
You are carrying the Messiah. How did she know that? Because she'd been filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit had bring her a revelation. There is no other explanation than it's a supernatural message that she's received through the Holy Spirit that Mary has been chosen for this purpose. Incredible detail in this. And she celebrates and she declares, blessed are you, Mary. And she declares, I'm favored. You've come to my house. The mother of the Lord has come to me. This is incredible. She understands something in the Holy Spirit. And then she celebrates it with Mary. She celebrates what she sees God doing in Mary's life. I wonder, how easy do we find it to celebrate what God is doing in other people's lives? Now, this could have been a moment of real tension, actually. Uh, Mary, the young relative, could have turned up proud, could have boasted in the story, guess what's happened to me? You won't believe it. An angel came. Yes, you are blessed that I've come to stay to your house. Absolutely so, because angel Gabriel came to me. But there's no pride in Mary's tone here. Elizabeth could have maybe felt resentful. She spent her whole life wanting a child, agonizing over it, feeling the public scorn of it. She's elderly and pregnant now, but why, why did she have to wait so long? Why did God not bless her earlier? Why did she have to endure the years of waiting and the gossip of the community. And here's Mary, the teenager, turning up and talking about virgin births. And she could have felt resentment in her heart. She could have felt jealousy, maybe, or envy. Or she could have responded saying, well, it's okay for her, isn't it? What about me? I have to wait all these years. Or she could have said, oh, great. I thought I had a great miracle story. And now Mary turns up and trumps all of it, saying she's going to have a baby as a virgin. We can all sometimes respond in these ways when we hear what God is doing in other people's lives. It's going to be so easy to react when we hear of what God is doing, but not be able to celebrate, actually. That can happen individually when we struggle to celebrate what we see God doing in someone else's life. It can happen in a bigger scale as well. I can remember times when I was younger of hearing of what God was doing in another church and actually struggling to celebrate it. Almost like I was hoping it wasn't quite as successful as I made out it to be. Um, I'm glad to say I think I'm through that now. I really hope I'm through that now. Um, But I struggled sometimes to celebrate God's favor on another place because I guess I I was envious or jealous or just insecure, probably. But sometimes it can be hard to celebrate what God is doing in someone else's life. And here we have this beautiful story of Elizabeth saying, no, no, you are blessed. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to worship. This is amazing news. There's none of that with Elizabeth and Mary. There's no jealousy or resentment or envy. Instead, the Holy Spirit inspires Elizabeth to shout with excitement. Can you do that for someone else? Can you shout with excitement when you see God's favor on someone else's life? There's also an incredibly beautiful, multi-generational thing here going on that we should not miss. So important that we don't miss this. Elizabeth is older, very old in years. Mary was the teenager. They're completely different generations. And God's done something in Mary's generation that he hadn't done in Elizabeth's generation. It was new, it was unexpected, it was God breaking out in a brand new miraculous way. How would Elizabeth respond? Would she respond with doubt or would she respond with cynicism or would she dismiss Mary's story? Or did she say, well, you may be excited, but it's because you're young, have a few years life experience and the excitement will wear off. There's none of that here with Elizabeth, even though they're in different generations. No, Elizabeth welcomes what God was doing in a younger generation and celebrated it. There's no jealousy. There's no cynicism. Are we able to do that as well? Are we able to see what God might be doing in a younger generation, even though it may not have happened like that for us, and say, brilliant, fantastic, great. It's different than our experience, but we're going to fan it into flame. We're going to encourage it. Are we able to do that one generation to another? It's a beautiful picture here. We have This older woman, pregnant at last after hope had gone, and this younger woman, pregnant far sooner than she was expecting, and they're celebrating together what God is doing in one another's generations. When you think about it, it's beautiful they even want to hang out together, I think. Here's Mary, the teenager. She's thinking, where do I go now? I'm going to go to my older relative 100 miles away. 
not popping around for a cup of tea. It's like an intentional decision. Who do I need to spend time with? I need to spend time with Elizabeth. And she wants to be with someone in an older generation. And Elizabeth opens up her doors and her heart to the younger generation and says, yes, come, I'm going to encourage and bless what God is doing. It's so good, so helpful. Guys, we must not just hang out with our peers in church life. We've been called to be family, multi-generations, loving, serving, encouraging one another. We lose out when we only hang out with people who are the same age as us and like us. We miss out. Here is Mary, of all the people she could have spent time with, she wants to spend time with Elizabeth, and she travels. Let me speak to guys here, if you're in your teens and 20s. Listen, be like Mary. Find people in the church who are older than you, that you respect and admire, and hang out with them. Learn from them. Laugh with them. Share your fears and your excitements with them. Ask them to tell you their stories of walking with God when it was good and when it was hard, when they had to persevere. Ask them about what it means to hold on to God in suffering. Ask them what it means to keep going in prayer even when it's difficult. To ask them about victories won and battles fought. Make it a priority to hang out with people older than you who have walked the walk, who can encourage and fan into flame what God is doing in your life. Don't just hang out with your peers. Mary's going to be with this older relative. If you feel like God has called you to something as a younger person, brilliant. Go and find an older person who can encourage you in that, who can give you wisdom and counsel and advice because of the lessons they have learnt in God. And those of us from an older generation, as be like Elizabeth, celebrate what you see God doing in a younger generation, even if it is different than what God did in your generation. Celebrate it. Encourage it. Fan it into flame. It might look different. It probably will look different, actually, because God does new things all the time. Probably won't be the same as what God did in your generation. Doesn't mean it's not real and authentic. Encourage it. Encourage the grace of God that you see in the younger generation. This is a beautiful picture of different generations celebrating God together. And it's in this context that Mary burst forth in song. The Magnificat is a Latin word based on the first word of this song, and we'll read it together. Verse 46, Mary then, in response to Elizabeth, sings, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. To Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And then we read, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Mary just bursts forth this incredible song of worship, of declaration of who God is. It speaks of his mercy and his provision and his promises. She sings about how God will overthrow the proud but will raise up the humble and how he will fulfill his purpose from one generation to another in the midst of everything that must be going through her mind. The uncertainty, the the fear, the excitement, the nervousness. In all of her human emotion, Mary responds with worship and declaring how great God is. It's a personal song as well. Last week, Harry took us through the verses where the angel Gabriel called Mary. We see initially she was troubled by the angel's words. So she was troubled. Then it says she was confused. How will this be? Then we see there's this like beautiful submission and obedience. Here I am, I will be your servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. So we have like a fear and trouble into confusion to obedience. Now obedient leads into worship. As she realizes the great privilege of being caught into the purposes of God. As she declares, my soul glorifies the Lord. 
And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servants. It's like, it's like Mary can't quite believe it. Here she is, an ordinary young woman from a very ordinary town and a very ordinary family. Her parents aren't even mentioned. We don't even know who they are. And God's chosen her. Her song mentions God's mighty acts in history. It speaks of like the father of the Jewish faith, Abraham. And his descendants and all that God has achieved through generations. And it's like with stunning realization and surprise and wonder, she suddenly realizes, hang on a second, I'm going to play my part in God's plan just like Abraham. He, he's called me, little old me, to be involved in this great story of what God is doing through the generations of all the women in the world, of all the times in human history, of all the things God could have done, of all the people he could have chosen, he's asked me to do this. And she just burst out in praise and wonder and worship, even though what she's been asked to do is so daunting, even though it may damage relationships, even though it may damage reputation, even though she's going to see things that um, I guess no mum would ever, ever want to see, heartache and pain and loss even though all that is ahead, she still can't quite believe God's chosen her. It's, it's personal for her. Look at verse 49. The mighty one has done great things for me, she sings out. It's like, he's done it for me, little old me from little old Nazareth. He's called me. What favor, what grace. Church, isn't that true of every single one of us? Yeah, sure, Mary's call was unique. It was unique to carry Jesus. But when we consider who we are and consider who God is, the fact that he would call us by name and say, you, I've got a plan for you. I've got a call on your life. I'm going to save, rescue you, and I've planned things for you to do. Shouldn't our response be just the same as Mary's? How blessed am I that God has chosen me? I still can't get believe I get to do what I do in this job. It's the greatest, most humbling privilege of my life. There's moments where I say, I can't believe God. You know everything about me. You know everything about me. And yet you've asked me, wow. Doesn't it just want to bring you to worship when we consider God has chosen us? When we think of all the people he could have asked at all the times in history, of all the people that seem more qualified, more able, more together. And he's like, no, no, I'm calling you to it. Doesn't want you to shout out in praise. This is amazing. This is awesome. Of all the people who could have asked. And Mary's so moved by this vision of God, the lover of the lowly, the one who raises up the humble, the one who calls us into his world-changing plans, that she just worships him. It just reminds us, church, as if we need reminding in the middle of Christmas and the next couple of weeks, the very heart of the Christmas story is a young woman worshiping God. If we miss worship out of the next couple of weeks, we've missed everything. <laughs> if we've missed the point that the Christmas story is meant to call us to respond to God in wonder, we've missed everything. Mary is caught up in wonder that she gets to play her part. She is not concerned at all that people should be worshiping her for carrying Jesus. There is nothing in this that she is elevating herself. All she wants to do is elevate the Father and say, look at him. Look at him. She wants all worship to be focused at him. Right at the center of the narrative is a young woman worshiping God. May I encourage us at the center of our Christmas story is men and women worshiping God for calling us into his purposes and plans. If God has chosen you, if he's called you, if he's rescued you, if he's invited you, what should our response be? My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. That's true of you, it's true of me. The story of Mary and Elizabeth actually reminds us that with God, it's often those on the margins that get drawn into the center of the story. Isn't that wonderful? He chose to occupy himself with two quite obscure, humble women, one old and barren, one young and a virgin. And God wants to occupy himself with you. 
with us this Christmas. Ordinary as we are, broken as we are, on the margins as we are, he says, come, come, I'm with you, come to me. I want us to worship in a moment, so let me start to land. It's amazing, when you think back to Luke's reason for writing this, he's writing to his friend Theophilus. I'm writing you an account of everything that happens right from the beginning. I've thoroughly investigated. It's like Luke is wanting Theophilus to know in God's kingdom, it's not the wealthy, it's not the proud, it's not the mighty that becomes center stage. It's the humble, it's the lowly, it's the broken, it's those on the margins. They're the ones that God calls. As he Mary's song speaks about the God who actually raises up the humble but brings down the mighty. He fills the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. It's like Luke wants Theophilus to know, no, no, God's looking for humble people. He's looking for lowly. He's looking for those who know they need God. He's looking for those who are willing, in obedience and worship, to step in, even though they know they've got nothing to offer themselves. Not the proud or the mighty or the rich who have the last words, but ordinary, humble, lowly men and women This is what he's done in Mary's life. This is what he's done in my life. It's what he does. Takes us ordinary as we are. He says, come. Come into something extraordinary through me. And Luke is saying to his friend Theophilus, look what God is really like. He's not impressed by our pride. He's not impressed by our power or our money or our might. He's impressed by our humility and our willingness and our servanthood. God wants to include you in his purposes. But the response is, Always, always, when God gives an invitation to us because of his kindness, must be worship, must be to say, the mighty one has done great things for me, so I will rejoice in him. Shall we worship together? Shall we worship? Let's just spend some time. I wonder, team, if we can... um...